Welcome to this lesson on the lithosphere. Today, we will look at how gold is extracted from the earth and how it is refined. Kiki will take us through the process, but first, she explains a little of the background. During this lesson, we are going to learn about a very important metal, gold. And what better place to learn about gold than a city that is named after it, Ekoli, South Africa's place of gold. We are going to learn about the history of gold and why it is so valuable. We are also going to pay particular attention to the mining and processing of gold in South Africa. Right, let's go. Gold is very rare. It is 75th on the list of elements found in the lithosphere. Even though it's so rare, gold has been found and used in many parts of the world for long periods in our history. Today, most of the world's gold is mined in Russia, Australia, Canada, Ghana and South Africa. South Africa has the largest known deposits of gold and this is mostly found in the Witwatersrand Basin. This is an amazingly rich deposit. In fact, a third of all the gold ever mined anywhere on Earth has come from this basin in the last 120 years. Gold exploration in the Witwatersrand Basin has found these reefs stretching in a golden arc from Ivanda in Mpumalanga to Valkom in Free State. The farm Lang Lachter, which is now part of Johannesburg, is where gold was discovered in 1886. This find was a rich reef that was very close to the surface. However, in some places we think that the gold reef could be up to 8 kilometers underground. You can imagine that this makes it very difficult to get to it. South Africa has become the world leader in both mining technologies and in processing gold ore to get pure gold. Now, let's visit one of Johannesburg's oldest gold mines, which is now part of Gold Reef City. I'm in the mint at Gold Reef City to find out more about why gold is considered to be so valuable. What I found out is that gold stands out in comparison to other metals because of its unique color and it does not combine very easily with other elements to form compounds. Gold is both ductile and malleable. This means that very fine strands of gold can be made into chains by jewelers and very flat sheets can be rolled out to decorate tiles, glass and ceramics. Another characteristic of gold is that it's an inert metal, which means that, unlike other metals such as iron, copper and silver, gold does not react with oxygen in the air. This reaction turns other metals dull, and we say that they tarnish or rust. Gold does not tarnish or rust, but remains unchanged over time. This is the reason gold is used to make coins and jewelry. Gold is also a very good conductor of electricity, even better than copper, and so is used on solar panels on spacecrafts. These are all excellent reasons as to why gold is valued. But it seems to me that the value also has a lot to do with the fact that people have attached such a special significance to this metal. Gold is associated with the best. For example, the winner of an athletic race is given a gold medal. Even when referring to a good time in history, people call it the Golden Age. So, now we know why gold is so valuable. But where did it come from? Now Professor Terence McCarthy will tell us how gold came to be in this area. This is a geological map of Johannesburg and um, each one of these colors here represents a layer of a different kind of rock. And these layers really are arranged um, like a bowl. We call it a basin. And what we're seeing here, these uh, curves are really like the edges. You can imagine a whole lot of these bowls all one inside the other getting smaller and smaller. The topography of Johannesburg and the conditions um, in the past were very different from what we see today. This area was uh, relatively high ground sticking up and this marked the edge really of, um, um, of the start of a, of a plain which marked the edge of the ocean. The ocean lay, sea lay to the south here and uh, erosion was taking place in the north and bringing sediments down and amongst those sediments we find uh, there was a lot of pebbles and that produced rocks uh, which contain rounded pebbles. These are called conglomerates. Now in these conglomerates uh, we find some very interesting things and um, amongst them are uh, minerals, mineral grains, rounded grains of a mineral called pyrite which is iron sulphide 
and uh, even more important, we find tiny grains of gold, uh, which one can see here in this conglomerate. Now, the reason for that is that gold is very dense, and um, it's not easily transported by flowing water. And there was gold in these source rocks here to the north that were rising and being eroded, and that gold grains, along with all other things, were being transported, but conditions just to the south here were exactly perfect to allow gold grains to be to settle and the um, lighter grains, the less dense material, to be washed away. <coughs> Excuse me. And over time, these gold grains became more and more concentrated in these conglomerate layers. So these are what the, the miners extract today. They range in thickness from um, a few centimeters up to tens of meters. And the concentrations of gold on average are very low. They're about uh, six grams for every ton of rock. Uh, but occasionally these layers become extremely rich and the reported cases of, of uh, gold concentrations getting up to thousands of grams per ton of rock. But the average for the industry today is about six or seven grams per ton, which is very low. Uh, but given the gold price, it's still economic to extract them. Now that we know how gold came to be in the lithosphere, let's hear from KK how the gold is extracted from the earth. Did you know that if you were a gold miner, to get to the reef, you would have to go down a vertical shaft in a cage? A system of pulleys and steel cables work the cages carrying miners and equipment down into the ground. The gold reef at this mine goes from the surface and slopes beyond 220 meters. The temperature increases by 2 degrees Celsius with every 100 meter increase in depth. Now this makes a mine a very hot and unpleasant place to work in. Once you get to the bottom of the shaft, a set of intricate tunnels called crosscuts, drives and razors take you to the reef. The working areas are called stopes. These areas can be narrow passages of only 80 centimeters across. In some places, the stopes can be wider, up to 3 meters, depending on the size of the reef to be mined. Having rock walls on either side of you can be strange and a bit frightening. I can only imagine what it's like drilling holes in the rock face in front of you and then loading those holes with explosives for blasting. I'm sure you can see that being a miner is not an easy job at all, and it's not a well-paid job either. The work is demanding physically, the conditions are terrible, and there is always the danger of mining accidents. In addition, most miners live in hostels on the mines without their families for most of the year. Now that we know where gold comes from and how we get it up from underground, we still need to know how it goes from a lump of rock to the yellow shiny metal that we know. After blasting, both the gold-bearing rock and waste rock is brought to the surface using the cages. Waste rock is dumped while the gold-bearing rock is transported to a metallurgical treatment plant above ground. This is where the gold is removed from the ore. A large lump of rock contains a lot of unusable material and very little gold. The ore may also contain very small quantities of other useful metals such as platinum, lead, copper and silver which are treated as impurities in the recovery of gold. Now, let's go back to the studio where we will look at the extraction process in more detail. Okay, the first step in extracting gold from the ore is by grinding and crushing the gold-bearing rock into a powder. This process is called milling. Next, water is added to the powdered solid, forming a suspension called a slurry. The slurry is pumped into large tanks called pachucas, where potassium cyanide is added to the slurry and oxygen is bubbled through it. You'll remember that gold is an inert metal. It does not react easily to form compounds. It does not even react with sulfuric acid. However, gold does react in an aqueous solution of potassium cyanide and oxygen to form potassium gold cyanide and potassium hydroxide. In this reaction, the gold dissolves out the powdered rock. The process is called leaching. The other metals are also leached out of the powdered rock. Here is a question for you to think about. Can you suggest why milling is important before the leaching process? Milling crushes rock into very small pieces. The smaller the pieces, the larger the surface area for the chemical reactions to take place. 
So, the increased surface area of the milled rock improves the efficiency of the leaching process and allows us to extract even very small amounts of gold from a large mass of rock. After the leaching reaction, the mixture in the pachucas is filtered. The insoluble crushed rock, or gang, is left on the filter as a residue. It is scraped off and pumped into waste dumps. The filtrate contains potassium gold cyanide in solution. In the next stage of the process, charcoal is used to extract gold ions from the filtrate. A piece of charcoal has millions of tiny pores. It looks like a sponge. The pores give the carbon a gigantic surface area. A heaped teaspoon of activated carbon has a greater surface area than a football field. During the filtration process, the gold-bearing solution from the pachucas is passed through a number of vessels containing charcoal. The charcoal adsorbs the gold cyanide complex from the solution. Adsorption is the process by which one substance accumulates on the surface of another substance. This is different to absorption, where one substance is taken in by another substance. The gold cyanide complex is then washed off the charcoal using a solution of sodium hydroxide and potassium cyanide. The washing process is called elution. The gold cyanide complex washed from the charcoal is highly concentrated. The adsorption and elution processes are carefully regulated by temperature and give a 99,92% gold yield. Next, electricity is used to recover the gold in its elemental state from the gold cyanide solution. Scrap iron is used as an electrode in the process called electrowinning. Electrowinning is a redox reaction. The iron from the electrodes loses three electrons and the gold ions in solution each gain an electron to form solid gold. This gold is cast into bars called bullion. Gold bullion is only 85% pure. Impurities such as silver and base metals, iron, copper and lead make up 15%. Platinum and palladium occur in small concentrations. Gold from all the gold mines is sent to the Rand refinery in Germiston for purification. In the first stage of purification, the gold bullion is melted at about 1150 degrees Celsius and chlorine gas is blown through the melted gold. The base metals react with the chlorine gas forming metal chlorides. The iron, lead and zinc form gaseous chlorides and evaporate from the melt. The gold from the first stage of purification has 99,5% purity. It is used for jewelry, making coins, in art and decoration and even for filling and fixing teeth by dentists. However, certain uses require gold that is 99,99% pure. A second stage of refining is required to achieve this. The second stage of refining uses electricity. The 99,5% pure gold from stage 1 is melted and electricity is passed through it. Pure gold deposits on the positive electrode. This pure gold is then melted and cast as billets. It is suitable for electronics, space technology and medical equipment. I'm sure that you can see that during the extraction process there are a number of important chemical reactions. One of the most important of these is the reaction that takes place when the crushed gold ore reacts with potassium cyanide and oxygen. In this reaction the reactants are gold, potassium cyanide, water and oxygen. The products formed are aqueous solutions of potassium gold cyanide and potassium hydroxide. Now, can you write a balanced chemical equation to represent the change taking place? Compare your answers to mine. First, I wrote down the symbols of all the reactants and the products. I added in the phase indicators to show that gold is a solid, potassium cyanide is an aqueous solution, water is a liquid, and oxygen is a gas. Clearly this reaction is not balanced. Notice that there is one cyanide on the left hand side, but two on the right hand side.
the number of potassium and hydrogen atoms are also not the same. You could balance this equation by trial and error, but there is another possibility. Notice we have oxygen gas as a reactant and oxide as a product. This means that oxygen gained electrons, so this must be a redox reaction. Can you identify which substance has lost electrons? Look at the equation. Gold was an element with an oxidation number of zero, and in the product gold is an iron with an oxidation number of plus one. So, each gold atom loses one electron. Now, in any redox reaction, the number of electrons transferred must be the same. Each oxygen atom gains two electrons, so a total of four electrons are gained. This means that four gold atoms must be involved in this reaction. We show this by placing a four in front of the gold symbol in the reactant and in the product. The 4 in front of the potassium gold cyanide complex makes the potassium and cyanide unbalanced. We can balance the cyanide by placing an 8 in front of the potassium cyanide and a 4 in front of the potassium hydroxide. Now, the final thing is to check the oxygen and hydrogen. In the product, there are four hydrogens and four oxygens. In the reactant, there are only two hydrogens in the water molecule. So, by placing a two in front of the water, both the hydrogens and the oxygens will now be balanced. Now, using charcoal as a filter to extract gold is a relatively new process. Previously, zinc was used to precipitate gold from the potassium cyanide solution. As you can imagine, there are many problems associated with the way we mine gold, both from the point of view of the miners and also the effects of the refining process on the environment. We will discuss these issues in other lessons. You will also find it helpful to get more practice on balancing redox equations. You will find more information at our website www.mindsearch.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.